we thank you, Papa God, for letting us gather like this in your most holy name. <coughs> Once again, we just invite your Holy Spirit to come and take us over. That we go out of here a whole lot better than we came in. Amen. Amen. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. So, um, the question I have for you this morning is what do you think is weighing you down? What's hindering you today? Was it the same thing that was hindering you, holding you back yesterday or last year, or several years ago? What do you think has wounded you and, and allowed the devil a legal place to interfere with you as a child of God? Those are the questions I want to put forth this morning. So I want to continue. As we continue the Word of God, and we believe the Word of God, because he said what he means and means what he said, um, we can get truly free. Life can get released. Um, healing is released. Restoration power of the Holy Spirit is released. And so you can be blessed to the Lord and you can go and bless others for the kingdom of God. It's not a good thing. So all true healing and restoration begins in your soul. And, and that's um, when we tap into the dunamis power of God. <coughs> When, when you look up in the Greek, no, there's different versions of Greek, but dunamis is, is a word that comes um, <coughs> um, miraculous, kind of like dynamite. That's where we get that word dynamite from, dunamis. So again, if we look at Acts 1 and verse 8, but ye shall be perceived power, that's dunamis power, like dynamite power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judah and Samaria, the other most parts of the earth. So you can go all the way down to Atlanta, right past Samaria. <laughs> so the Lord Jesus taught us that there was two things that caused people to go into error. <clears throat> Do you know what those two things are? Yeah. Well, it's not knowing the scriptures and not knowing the power of God, mm -hmm. right? Because it says in Matthew 22 to 29, Jesus answered and said unto them, you do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. He also said that again in um, Mark 12, 24, and Jesus answering, saying unto them, do you not therefore err because you do not know the scriptures, neither the power of God? So that's the way you want to say it, it comes down to two things. Because we know the word of God, we've got to understand the power of God. So we've seen some amazing testimonies. When the, when the devil comes and starts messing with you, it's a really good time to start remembering testimonies. <coughs> because it builds you up, it encourages you. Amen? Amen. You think of all the amazing things the Lord's done just in your life. And, and, and miraculous testimonies, you know, we've heard um, as we to study, stay on the city in the path of holiness and, and we're denying ourselves, picking up our cross, following after Jesus. So I think there's some, some keys here to getting free and, and, and miraculous because that's what we're all about here, isn't it? Because we're entering into this Passover celebration and so I want to remind you um, Jesus said in, in John 10, and we'll start in verse 14, I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. And as the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And the other sheep I have, which are not in this fold, them also I must bring. And they shall hear my voice, and there should be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore does not my Father lo love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. And this is key, right? No man taketh from me, but I lay it down for myself. I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it again. This commandment I have received of my Father. And then there was division among them. Um, for the Jews, for, the, for him saying this, and I know that it caused a, a lot of stir among the, the crowd, and then goes on to say, and then 
many said, oh, he's a devil, he's mad, do you just hear what he's just saying? And the other one said, no, um, you know, he doesn't have a devil. If he had a devil, how could he open the eyes of the blind? How could he do these miraculous healings? Okay, so Jesus gave us a mandate. In Luke 10, 19, behold, I give unto you the power. Okay, that's what kind of power? Doing yes. his power. Tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So I, I want to review a couple of things this morning. <clears throat> we're a body, we're a soul, and we're a spirit. And when you were born again, your spirit was made perfect, right? We're at 1 John 1 9, we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So all, all unrighteousness, <coughs> right? Because we're made in the righteousness of Christ now. So that simply means that, so all the problems in your life are not simply coming from your <coughs> own again spirit, are they? So where are they coming from? Let's guess. <laughs> How is this happening? Because we're living in a fallen world. Again, Proverbs 26, 2 says, As the bird by wandering and the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. So the devil needs a, a legal right to hinder you. He's, he's, he's doing, he has to have a legal right to hinder your destiny in Christ. Because it says in 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Having therefore these promises dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So meaning our spirit can get dirty just like our flesh does, which is why we're supposed to take a shower every day, right? Cleanse the filth, right? It smells like a good idea, right? Um, so our spirits can get stuff on them. How does that happen? The enemy's projecting, he's always projecting toxic imaginations. And you can start to, to listen to those lies, it defiles your spirit. So Ephesians 5 26 says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water of the word. Again, in Psalm 51 10 says, Create in me a clean heart of God, renew a right spirit in me. So your, your, your soul gives your body life. And your spirit is, is basically your free will and your emotions. We've taught on that before, so don't go over it all now. So, we all have to go through this process of sanctification. So why would we need our souls that need to be cleansed and purified? Because according to the Holy Scriptures here, that our souls can be wounded. Our souls have been literally wounded through two main common sources that I see, through as a pastor, I hear about this for years now, right? When people come and they need ministry, they're either talking about sins that they participated with that wounded their soul, or traumas that happened to them that wounded their soul. So all of us, have, you know, after we become born again, we, we've um, been tempted to do things that we ought not do. And we're not always obeying the Holy Spirit, you know, sometimes um, I think the Holy Spirit's clearly telling us, talking to us about something. And we we want to go this other way, and that the rebellious thing takes over, and we go, well, I'll deal with that later. Let me go. And we always pay a price for that when we don't listen. <coughs> we allow that spirit of pride to enter in, and to be entertained. We entertain the spirit of pride, but what are we doing? But we're opening a portal for the devil to come in build up strongholds and release toxic chemicals in our bodies. And we've probably all, you know, rebelled in numerous ways. Maybe you didn't do all the obvious sins that the world embraces. Maybe you weren't really into all the sex, drug, and rock and roll, or alcoholism, or adulteries, or um, maybe you just simply watched toxic type of television shows, or toxic books, or movies, and that's what it, those things <coughs> define us. So maybe it wasn't the obvious stuff, maybe it was the church gossiped. How many churches are, you know, 
um, not repenting and asking forgiveness for those places where you, well, let's go pray for so and so, but you ended up gossiping about it. So maybe you know, um, it could be chronically um, know, overeating, over drinking, uh, all those kind of things. You know, the, the scriptures address the sin. They can wound us in those places. Maybe somebody sinned against you. They attacked you. They um, they rejected you. Uh, maybe you got molested. They abandoned you. Uh, they talked evil against you, unjustifiably. Those things are painful to your soul. They wound your soul. And then, then we've got these painful, tragic events that have happened in our lives, where um, we had, you know, a death in the family, a loss of a, a job, um, <coughs> loss of home and family, uh, children, painful divorces. All those traumatic events do what? They, they wound your soul. And any wound that's left unattended will probably get worse and infected and cause other problems. I remember a story where Derek Prince, um, being the, the brilliant scholar that he was, when he was one of the famed desert rats, and they made him basically um, what you call an orderly here. Okay, Derek Prince, you're an intellectual scholar, we'll have you empty bedpans. Good. Give you something useful to do with your life, you know. So he's emptying bed pounds, working with a, a surgeon, and they're bringing in the wounded soldiers. And so this soldier comes in with shrapnel, and, and Derek says, Should I get a bandage, you know, and bandage up? And the doctor scolded him and said, No, we've got to get the foresight, we've got to take the shrapnel out, because if you leave that in there, it'll cause blood poisoning and make it much worse. I thought that was an excellent example of how we can't just put bandages on things. We've got to get those wounds to heal up. Amen. So the Lord gives us some keys to understanding. I think two simple keys here is getting your soul healed first is keeping the holy scriptures that Jesus said, you know, in his shed blood um, at the cross for every sin that that whatever wound your soul, he paid for that. Amen? For it is the, it's the blood that make it atonement for the soul. We read in um, Leviticus 17, 11, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that make it atonement for the soul. So whenever you're, you're starting to get healing for for your soul, that's where you start with the blood. But we have to understand something. That that's when we sin, when we, we sin, we can deeply wound us. And any sin can deeply wound us. And um, there's a different power, a special power, I think, that's especially for healing, for those wounds that come from sins that also come from the traumas in our life. And what is that power? It's, it's that dunamis power. It's it's um, it's all powerful, you know. It's it's the same power that caused the resurrection. I think sometimes we gloss over these things, so I don't want to gloss over them. I want to really focus on that this morning. So the power to perform miracles. This also means, you know, the the excellence of your soul. It, it's an awesome power that Christ can heal the wounds that they came from any place. Wherever we entered into agreement with any kind of sin or trauma, Jesus can heal that, right? Because think about it. Without the resurrection, Jesus' payment that he paid on the cross doesn't go into effect. You have to have the resurrection, otherwise none of this would take effect. So I pray you can understand what I'm sharing here. Jesus paid a, a full and complete payment for the penalty of our sins, and he also paid for every disease and every sickness. He paid it on the cross, uh, and unless there was a resurrection, that payment couldn't go into effect. How could it possibly go into effect? But it did. So now we got appropriated, and, and, and we got to walk in faith. No matter what the enemy's doing, he might have some symptoms that you're dealing with, 
Gott sagt, ich bin der Gott, der mich heilt. Ich bin der Gott, der mich heilt. Ich bin der Gott, der mich heilt. Ich bin der Gott, der Okay, because, see, without the resurrection, as we're going into this Passover season, Jesus would still be another man. He'd just be lying in a tomb. He'd be like all those other, you know, religions that have some guy rotting corpse in a tomb somewhere. Hallelujah, he's forever alive. Physically alive. How amazing. So now, the Holy Scriptures, a guidebook to the supernatural, tells us in 3 John 1 verse 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou may prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. That we be prospered in our health, even as our soul prospers, because you see, our, our physical health is directly connected to what? Our soul's health. I've shared many times in my writings and preaching over the years, how science is acknowledging that 80 to now 98%, 80 to 98% of all sicknesses and disease begin where? In your thought life, connected to your soul. Those deadly diseases that are killing people that we love, they have evil spirits connected to them. They're coming upon people that have lived through numerous traumatic ex you know, experiences and, and stressful situations in their life. So those deep wounds, they trigger th thoughts which release toxic chemicals. They break down the immune system. They re they, an over-secretion of cortisol is being released, breaking down your, your ability to fight back. It's caused people to develop sicknesses and diseases, especially those deadly diseases. Because the devil only comes to do what? Still kill and destroy. But well, hallelujah, Jesus came to give us a life more abundantly. Amen? Yeah. So, we, we, the way to be healed and delivered through the finished work of Jesus, there's so many amazing testimonies that, um, and, you know, it, it makes the devil scare when we start sharing testimonies. <laughs> He's full of fear. So, let's, let me take you to some place here. The question has been asked so many times, and I want to address it again. How come Jesus only healed one man at the pool of Bethesda? What's with that? Well, let's examine it. Um, in, in John 5, it says, Jesus, um, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is a Jerusalem by the sheep market, a, a pool, which is called in Hebrew tongue Bethesda having five porches. By the way, they, they've located this place. And in these, in these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, a blind and halt wizard, waiting for the moving of the water. For the angel went down, a certain season into the pool, troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole, and what sort of disease he had. Isn't that amazing? All you had to do is get in the water as soon as the angel stood it up and you were, you were healed, right? No matter what you had, it doesn't talk about, I had to repent first. Think about it, right? You just got in the water, zap, you were healed. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity 30 and 8 years. That's a long time to suffer. When Jesus saw him lie, and he knew that he'd been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Will thou be made whole? And the important man answered, Sir, and he's going to complain now. I have no man to, when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but I, while I am coming, another steps down before me. Now think about this. This guy didn't repent. Jesus just said, Rise up, take up your bed, and walk. So like, okay, I'm done with this. Get up, walk. And immediately, straight away, right? And immediately the man was made whole, took up his bed and walked on the same day this was the Sabbath. So how often do people try and use this passage of scripture to argue that the Lord Jesus just picks and chooses some to be healed and ignores other people that are suffering? That's what they do. They'll, they'll take this passage and, and try to misquote it to you. So what happens to the fact that 
God is no respecter of persons. <coughs> Meaning he'll, what he'll do for one and do for another. We just read in, 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 in here in, in John 5, the story of the, the healing of the man at the pool here. That lame man was healed instantly. It was, it was a miracle. So the world is a mystery, but we, we call them miracles. And immediately the man was in whole, took up his bed and walked. So sometimes, and we probably all heard that in church sayings like, well, Jesus didn't always heal instantly. Um, you know, there were gradual healings. In other words, don't always expect a miracle. According to John 14, 12, that people are, you know, we're supposed to expect something happening here, right? Because we read in John 14, uh, 40, 12, this and greater things shall you do in my name. Well, let me take you to John 4, uh, John 4 um, before this. Remember, there wasn't any chapters, you know, this is originally written. In John 4, 46, so Jesus came again to Canaan uh, of Galilee, when he made um, water into wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judah into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. <coughs> then said Jesus unto him, Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The nobleman said unto him, Sir, come down to earth, my child die. And could you just imagine the, the, the anguish this guy has gone through? And he even approached Jesus. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, your son liveth. And the man believed the word of Jesus. Now that's the key point, right? The man believed the word of Jesus had spoken unto him. And he went his way. And as he was now going down, the servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of the hour when he began to amend. And he said unto him, Yesterday, the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew it was at the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and believeth in, uh, in, him, in himself, believeth in his whole heart. This again was the second miracle Jesus did when he came in the, um, Judah into Galilee. Um, at, at the conference a couple of weeks ago, um, the organizers were waiting for me to leave and the, the people kept wanting to come and ask questions and I was trying to get out because I knew the car was waiting to take us out before the next evening service. Um, and there was a group of women that were wanting to talk to me this one lady said, could you please just come over, just, just say hi to them. And, and I said, I'm so sorry, I, I, I can't talk. I really, they're waiting on me, I need to leave now. One of them blurted out, my, my daughter's sick, can you just say the word? And as she was still saying, I said, she's healed in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. She said, I believe it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's where it starts. Amen? Amen. You can do anything. Yeah. Hallelujah. So again, see, it was an instant healing miracle that Lord Jesus performed here. The boy was healed in the room. The very moment Jesus said, he lives. Because he is God, he can do anything. So Father way went away believing the word of Jesus gave him. How much time do we spend not believing the word of God, but believing the report of the doctor or the lawyer or you know the policeman or the principal or the school guard crossing the person or whatever? I mean, why don't we just believe the word of God? So I reckon maybe we would see more healing miracles. We just stayed in faith. Be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. The word, the words. You speak of great power in them. We got to do them as power as we speak. We got to be more careful with what comes out of our mouth. You know, in Matthew 12, 34, Christ says, For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Even as the, the, he starts speaking in the flesh, you know, let us finish speaking in the Holy Spirit. Just keep connected with the Holy Spirit. I think let us believe to see more people healed everywhere we go. Because that's what we're called to do. That's what he wants. And what he wants is what he's going to have. Amen? Amen? So bless people everywhere you go. That boy was healed the moment Jesus said, he lives. In fact, we don't really know how many healing miracles Jesus actually did. Because if, if um, you know, 
they wrote them all down. They said that the, the world couldn't contain them in the books. So they couldn't read it. You know, again, Acts 10 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Is God with us? Yeah. Amen. So we should be going around doing the same thing. <coughs> because God has anointed us with doing his power. When you got born again, you connected with doing his power. Dying in his power. <coughs> In Matthew 4, 23, and Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing all manner of sickness, all manner of disease among the people. So there wasn't any anything that wasn't healed, included any sickness, any disease, right? And his fame went throughout all Syria, and there were brought unto him sick people that were dying of diseases and torments, and they were possessed with devils, and those that were lunatic. The really wacky, crazy ones, and those that had the palsy, and he healed them, and he healed them. So here in John 5, we're simply told the details of this one particular healing, because we were to learn the powerful truth in this account. But I don't think he was like tiptoeing over other hurting people to get to that one guy. He probably healed them all. For someone to say that Jesus only healed this one man, that's just sheer speculation. So, uh, you know, let's keep with the word. I won't deviate anywhere from the scriptures. Revelation 22, 18 says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of the book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written therein, if any man shall take away from them. The words of this book of prophecy, God shall take away his part of the book of life out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. We, we can't deviate. No. We've got to stay accurate. Mm. I don't, we don't need to enhance. You know, like sometimes the people send stuff around the internet trying to enhance uh, a, a testimony. You don't need to do that. Just keep the facts the facts. Amen? Amen. So every, you know, every, very often scriptures people use to try to... Um, Indicate God only heals certain people, you know, that, that's just not true. It's not what the word says. Or how many times have people said, Oh, I believe God heals, but I don't think He'll heal me? Well, how come you're the exception? That's the spirit of pride working in reverse. So consider this the, the beginning of the John, chapter 5, it points out that he said, The pool of Bethesda. It's a well-known place for healing. A certain angel comes down. If you're the first person that got in, you know, miraculous healing overtakes you without you having to do anything except get in the water. I mean, God keeps providing so many ways and opportunities to be healed. I mean, many scholars seem to believe that this occurred during the Passover season. So that's why I want to talk about it this morning, <coughs> um, which lines up the biblical doctrine of healing and the atonement. So straight away this suggests that Papa God didn't, didn't determine you know, who got healed. When they got healed, they, they got you know, healed, whatever they got healed from, because he's no respect of persons. Of course, he, uh, being God knows who's going to get in the water, right? he knows everything. But clearly this is a form of freedom of choice from our side. And again, operating in faith, be it done unto you, according to your faith, right? Besides, healings already been paid for in the atonement. So this also seems to suggest that Papa God did um, dictate a time of a person's healing, because it's for today. Today is the day of salvation. It could happen any time you connect with that dunamis power. You got freedom of choice to do that. Remember how Mary turns to Jesus and says, "They've got no wine." And he goes, why do you involve me? It's not my time yet. She had the secret. She knew who he was. Mm -hmm. For 30 years, she's holding on to the secret. Imagine, you know, a woman not being able to share a secret. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she did that. And then, and then she turns in faith, and she says to the servants, do whatsoever he says. <clears throat> and so what we think about this. So Jesus, you know, Mary says, they've got no mind. The Holy Spirit, the Father says, it's not your time. 
Mary asks in faith, do whatever they say. Suddenly the father says to Jesus, well, I guess it is your time. Did you move the hand of God? Right? Can you do that too? Yes, you can. This also suggests that well, God didn't determine that some people should keep their illnesses and, until they learn something, right? That goes with the, I'm sick because God's trying to teach me something. Uh, I've had too many people come up to me in conferences over the years and tell me God gave them this disease because he's teaching them something. You know, well, have you learned it yet? <laughs> and I always have to ask them, are you seeing a doctor? And they go, yes. And I go, why are you seeing a doctor? And they go, because I don't want to get better. And go, well, you're a hypocrite, aren't you? You just told me God gave you the disease, so why are you going to a doctor? I mean, if God really gave you the disease and sickness, then you should just obey and you die quick. Right. Right? And I'm not trying to be hard-hearted. I'm just trying to wake you up to the reality of the word of God. He loves you, and, and he doesn't want you sick. It's not his plan. So there goes that, 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 that doctrine that, you know, it's, it's not God's will to heal everybody. That, that's ridiculous. So please take notice too here, and, and, and there's no mention of repentance for sin in the, in, in the John 5 account. Yes, repentance is absolutely important. We preach it every week. But you know, for any good minister, child of God, we should tell you about repentance. So, you know, you sin, no more at least the worst thing come upon you. But how interesting that Jesus healed first without getting that man to repent. Isn't that, that kind of throws that doctrine out the window. Then the story again suggests that Jesus Christ of Nazareth, you know, our total freedom from sickness and disease. He's our Passover lamb. He's our atonement. People have been healed taking communion. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping we'll do that next week. Mm. So prepare your hearts now. But listen, no matter what you're going through, what's really important here is that we're going to believe the Word of God. Yes. Psalm 118, 17 says, I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. But the devil's coming along with symptoms and problems yes. Trying to distract you from the reality of your God. You have to say, Stop. In the name of Christ, be for you, my soul. Yep. Okay? So we're going to keep God in our hearts. And don't forget who you are in Christ. Don't forget that dunamis power that lives in you as a true, born again, spirit filled believer. And you stay the course, you stay under the, the Lord's divine protection. Just giving into the most Holy Spirit, my, my, you know, my, best, my best Holy Spirit guess here would be that you're ready for a miracle today. So here's the thing. I, years ago, I, I, I was at the Polo Club, I was invited, and, and, and there was a guy that was like, from some posh newspaper, and, and they gave me some red wine. Not, you know, I, I didn't drink because it just doesn't fit into my, my mode of operation as a minister, even back then, even the pre pastor days. And we were talking, and he was <coughs> some big ma magazine you would know about if I told you which one. And um, I, I didn't realize I talked with my hand, you know. But, Maybe I'm around too much, too many Frenchmen or something. But uh, I was talking and I just ended up, he was wearing a white suit. It was summer, you know. And, 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 and I just splattered him with, with, with the red wine. And he said, I, I was kind of wondering why you didn't drink it. <laughs> um, and then he told him, you know, about my Christianity phase. And he sat there with a stain on it, you know, blood stain. But so what happens when, when you get a stain on you? What do you have to do? You're wearing clothes with like a white shirt, something like this guy here. Um, how do you get that stain off? You gotta soak it in some kind of solution, remove stains, right? Because right? Yeah. see, our, our souls, they're stained from sins. They're stained from the wounds that come from those sins and those traumas in our life. So if you had a serious stain on your clothes, you, you wouldn't 
just put a wee bit of soap on it, right? And, and, and briefly run it through the water, you probably soak the whole garment. Get the stain completely out. If you don't thoroughly soak a stain, it, it sets in. And then you walk around and people can see there was a stain there, right? It, it just, it lasts like a tattoo. So we don't get thoroughly soaked and immerse ourselves in the presence of Almighty Lord Jesus. Then those wounds of our soul are still going to be there. They're total, to, totally staining every area. Because they, they reach out and they, they end up tainting every area of our life. So you shall receive a, a real tangible miracle by, by engaging in a time of prayer when you get in the place of true worship. Believing the will is the, the Lord in His Word and then and, and appropriating, acting on that word. And I'm here to encourage you to, to really focus. Allow the Holy Spirit to be involved in every every thought, every 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 thought you have, all thirty thousand to seventy thousand thoughts. And then you're gonna get a breakthrough. Amen. So let's first let's pray first and I want you to look at pray. For everyone, in, everyone you've encountered, is, is, it's taken considered practice, right, to, to forgive. Because you're going to have to start, you know, going out in school. We've got, we've got to face this world when we leave here. And we've got to continue moving in the power of God. I, I think I'm probably doing more <coughs> praying, you know, just moving one the week and then just encountering people than I probably do it here. And, and we've seen, you know, I can't imagine how many times people have been healed in shopping centers now. I lost track. It's amazing. It's awesome. So look, let's just keep it simple. I want you to pray. Let's just go before the Lord right now. You close your eyes and just, just, just say this. Say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. I, repent I repent for any sin that I might have taken part in, that, that could have deeply wounded me and caused me these problems in my life or any long-term sickness or disease. Because I cover it now in the blood of Jesus, in your almighty name. And I forgive anyone that sinned against me that could have been the root cause of those long-term problems in, in my life and those diseases. I cover it right now in the holy blood of Jesus. Lord, you told us in Leviticus 17, you said the blood atones for the soul. So I accept it now. And I believe it right now. The blood is washing away every sin. Your holy blood is washing away every sin that ever wounded my soul. Because by your power and your might, I decree it, I proclaim it, I believe it, and I also decree any sin from my ancestors on both sides of my generation, all the way back to Adam, be washed clean now by the Holy Blood and the Almighty name of Jesus. Because I'm no longer like the man in the pool. Because my sin is being washed by the blood. And that sin is being resolving the problems in my life, the curses in my life that allow the spirit of infirmity to come. It's being removed now by the washing of the word, by the holy blood of Jesus. And I also repent, Father God, for entertaining the spirit of pride with thoughts of having me think that I'm always right, and that others are always wrong, that people need to listen to just me, because what I have to say is so important. Forgive me, Lord. The power God. We invite your angelic ministers to come 
Do whatever is necessary with me. Because I'm here to do what's pleasing in his sight. Amen. Hallelujah. So we're just going to keep forgiving Jesus. So many times as I have to forgive the disciples, as he said, just keep doing it. Yeah. Just keep doing it. The devil is going to come and try to lie to you. No, no, I'm going to forgive him again. I forgave him, I'll forgive him again. He says, draw to, nigh to God and draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So right now, nothing but the blood of Jesus. We sang it, we believe it. We're just going to cook. I'm doing the blood right now, right? It's going to take care of the, uh, whatever take responsibility for those long-term things that we've done in the name of Jesus where we're repenting and forgiving the power of the doomless power of the cross. See, the, the broken hearts are being mended right now. And we don't even know how this is going on over the internet. How many people are being blessed this morning? Eyes are seeing, ears are hearing again, the name of getting up and walking. We believe it. Yes. Amen. Yes. Thank you, Lord, for doing that. Baptized in the Christ and went down the death with him to the cross and saw so the blood right now. So I'd say, I'm, I'm baptized with Christ. I'm, with Christ. I'm covered in the supernatural blood. I'm covered in the supernatural blood. I'm baptized in Christ. I'm, baptized I'm covered in the blood. In the blood. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we can keep on repenting or keep on forgiving or keep on receiving yeah. the holy blood inside his soul. It's going to wash away the those stains, those sins of your soul. Amen? Amen. And so we've also been risen to new life with, with Jesus of the resurrection. <coughs> We're entering that time this season. We celebrate this. We have a new life. Our soul's being filled with new life. We've got dunamis power. Right? Because we, we, we praise thee because we were, were fearfully wonderful made. Marvelous sort of works that my soul knows right well. So say this. I'm being strengthened. I'm being reinforced in the almighty power of Christ my Lord. Thank you, Father God. My soul is being filled with Christ's dunamis power. And I receive it right now. I decree it. So long-term illnesses, whatever that wound is trying to hide right now, thank you, Lord, for the dunamis power. It's going to go right to it. It's going to go right to it. And the holy light is exposing the darkness in me. Create a clean heart in me, Lord. Create a clean heart. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Because we're going to prosper and be in health as our soul prospers. Yes, Amen. 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 Okay. Maybe there's already a change in your body. Maybe you're already feeling a change. Good. Thank you. Receive that healing, doing this power right now. Thank you, Lord. You know, sometimes I've prayed for people and they said, oh, I, I didn't get anything. And then they went home and realized they were healed. <laughs> I had several people over the years call me up the next morning and say, all the pain left, like guys that have broken backs and things like that, you know, they're, they're healed in the morning. So how is it going I don't know. I'm not God. I'm just here to serve. And so are you. So we're just going to, you know, believe the word. Yes. See, but anybody can see, since Adam's fall, how someone could come up with excuses and, and, and reasons uh, for concern about the future. Um, too many people walk around fearful of the future. I know we share a lot of stuff about what's going on prophetically, but we're not to fear these things. Amen. Jesus said, yeah, you can hear rumors of walls, and mm -hmm. there'll be wars and pestilence and famine. All this stuff's going to happen, but fear not. Exactly. Well, why would we fear? Why would we just be like Daniel, you know, three, Meshach, Shadrach, and, and Abednego? Just trust God. Yes. I don't know how it's going to work out, but I, I see, we know the word of God, and we know the power of God. Right. And we can't miss. Right. We can't miss. Amen? Amen? So it makes sense to me that we continually go with him and then boldly into his throne room. I mean, I went there last night. I had some stuff going on. I said, Lord, 
It's me, I have come right now. I know you're busy operating the whole universe, but you said I could do this, and you love me, and you love me first before I loved you, and, and I, I love you, and, and I know you want me to be blessed, so I gotta, I gotta interrupt the universe right now. I, I need something right now, Lord. Bless me now, heal me, restore me, Lord. So he says, Matthew 7, 7, Ask, and shall be given you, seek, and you shall find, knock, and shall be opened unto you. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, and you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with your all your heart. And I, I got to a point years ago. I mean, I still I, I, I go to sleep um, listening to the Word of God. I just you know, meditate on the Word of God, listen to testimonies. I just you know I, I fall asleep doing that. Sometimes I wake up doing that. I drive around listening to it when I'm going someplace. <coughs> Um, people ask me as a musician, you know, what, what kind of music do you listen to? And I feel so embarrassed to tell them I hardly ever listen to music. <laughs> I'd love to, I just don't get a chance to because I'm so hungry and thirsty for the Word of God. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So always remember that the Lord of God, He loves you. He wants the very best for you. He wants your, your families blessed, your marriage blessed, your children. He wants you healed, He wants you restored. This is what He wants. Yes. Let's give Him what He wants, yes. okay? Yes. So, you know, when, this, is, this is a time to make a difference for this kingdom while we still can. You know, because we don't, we don't allow that spirit of despair and depression to work us over, releasing all those nasty, toxic chemicals. Um, keep in mind, when you, when you cast out an evil spirit, if those programs are still there, now we've got some real work to do. I mean, you know, we can cast it out, but now we've got to take down those strongholds. So... <coughs> and that's why we keep renewing our mind with the washing of the word. That's why we have to keep re reviewing these things. So, um, I do want to, I didn't even get to the message yet. Um, because of, with the Psalm, 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 Psalm Sunday here, um, I, I want to think about this week how all things are possible to God. And then the Lord Jesus, he bore our sin to the cross, right? He, he, he took the sicknesses and disease, he took it all, and it, the prophecies, they're, they're all there, right? I mean, he fulfilled these amazing prophecies. And because of time, I'm not going to go through them all, but um, I know you know some of them. Again, Psalm 119, 165 says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. So you know, people can say bad things and lie about you and reject you, and I'm not going to be offended. Because I know the power of God, and I know His Word. Right? This is where we're going to get to. And again, you know, Romans 8, 28 promises all things work together. So even if you don't understand why we're going through this right now, it's okay. All things work together for good. For those that love Him, they're called according to His plan purpose. So this is, you know, we're not going to go into fear, but we're going to meditate on, on the Word of God. So right now, this week, I want you to really think about, as we prepare for Passover, Resurrection, and yes, Easter is the name of the pagan goddess, but I won't go there. <laughs> I've taught that a number of times before, and I feel like it really hasn't, I haven't seen a lot of benefit from it. I think it's really important that we know that, but um, let's just focus on the Word of God. Amen. Amen. So let me just meditate this week on the last seven statements the Lord made in this earth. In Luke um, 23, 34, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Can we do that? If he did that and we're supposed to emulate him and be more like him every day, we need to do this. And then they part of this his brain and cast them out, so we can just keep forgiving, keep forgiving, keep repenting for all those that have offended you and wronged you. They didn't know what they were doing. They listened to it lie the devil. And Luke 23, 43, then Jesus, the next thing he said, said unto them, Verily I say unto you, today shall thou be with me in paradise. And it tells us in, in 2 Corinthians 12, 1, 
it's not expedient for me to, to doubt this glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knows. Such one caught up in the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. How he's caught up in paradise. How he's caught up in paradise. And heard <coughs> unspeakable words which are not lawful for a man to utter. Now I still have things from that experience in 2001 that I cannot articulate. There's just no words to describe it, but it, it, it totally gave me a paradigm shift of reality. <coughs> In John 19, 26, we see that when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he said unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. Well, here is Christ's concern, the welfare of her and Mary. After excruciating you have no idea how excruciating the pain he went through for us. And here is what his concern for Mary. In, the, in his dying hour, it, it, so his, his earthly father Joseph had obviously passed away as we study the scriptures at this point. His brothers and sisters had not been convinced he's the Messiah, even though they grew up with him. So he turns to his mother, he turns to care over to the disciple. And the fourth thing was in Mark um, 15, 34. In the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lam sakma which is very hard to pronounce for me, so forgive me if I said it wrong. Which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So this, this moment, this precise moment, the Passover lamb is being sacrificed, by the temple priest. This is the moment when Jesus, having been connected to the Father, he's separated. Mm. At that moment, from the, the, must be the worst moment of all history in his suffering. And people that, that died, that, that do not enter heaven, and they suffer needlessly for, like this for all eternity because they refuse the Lord Jesus. So this was a necessary moment for the victory. Sometimes it looks like you're losing a battle to win the war. And this proves that all sin is absolutely horrible in God's um, sight. And you can't look on it. And that doesn't give you an incentive to stop rebelling. What will? So Jesus took all our sins at that moment and the wages of sin is death and he was separated from the Father. Praise the Lord, covered in his blood now. The fifth thing was in John nineteen twenty-eight. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. It's amazing to me how, how profound everything he said was. Uh, we read this, I mean, a simple, obvious statement, yet he fulfills two remarkable prophecies in the Old Testament. This was fulfilled as he said, I thirst. In Psalm 22, 15, my strength is dried up like a pot share, my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me from the dust of, the, of death. So after hanging on the cross for, for hours without a drink of water, his tongue must have been stuck to the roof of his mouth at this point. He could barely speak, just as anybody would have suffered like that. And, and the second prophecy is fulfilled in Psalm 69, 21. They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. So straight away the first thing here is that the thirst of Jesus was a sign of his humanity. And secondly, the, the thirst of Jesus was a sign of his substitution for us as sinners, even the sinning saints. Jesus said, I thirst because he's our substitute. He took our place on the cross. I think people don't realize sometimes he took your place on the cross. He suffered in the place 
you know, so we don't have to. When Adam ate that forbidden fruit in his mouth and rebelled, the moment the, the fruit that poisoned all mankind from that moment on. Romans 5 12 says, Wherefore, as one man's sin entered into the world and death by sin, so death passed upon all men for all have sinned. So through the mouth of the first Adam, making his descendants dead to his sins, Colossians 2 13 says, And you being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Mm. This is indeed amazing, marvelous good news. So we find that the last Adam, Jesus Christ, of Nazareth, paid the <coughs> sin for the first Adam. Because of Adam's rebellious mouth, by suffering pain in his own mouth. Adam's mouth was like a doorway to sin entering. He, he opened a portal to sin. And, and, and legally, he let the devil come into this world. And our Lord now suffered in such unspeakable pain. Keep in mind the depravity of the nature uh, that comes forth from this out of, the, out of our mouths. Jesus said again, you know, those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart. They defile the man. So the third thing here is that the thirst of the Lord Jesus cannot spare you from the thirst of hell. It's not amazing. That's marvelous goodness. So in the Gospel of Luke, I believe this is an actual event. It's not a parable because it gives us a real person's name. It tells us the man who died, right? People want to make this out of a parable. It's not a parable. This is a true account. In Luke 16, 22, and came to the past that the beggar who died was carried by the angels that Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus. Well, how could that be a parable? Send Lazarus. Was it the same Lazarus we read about? Could be. That he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. The sixth thing was in John um, 1930, John 1930, when Jesus therefore received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the coast. The so Lord Jesus' head was erect, but now he laid down his life. Remember he said, I, I lay down, I free to take it up again. He laid down his life, he gave up his spirit, his soul, and he, he went down to hell and he, he preached a sermon. And he liberated those Old Testament saints. And First Peter tells us, um, First Peter 3, 18, For Christ has once suffered for the sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to, to God, bring to put death in the flesh by quickening the spirit. But which he went into and he preached unto the spirits in prison. Well, I don't really feel like I have the time to, to tell you all about it, but there's this amazing accounts of um, that are not scripture, but and I, I know I've shared it before. Um, there's remember many came out of the grave and and, and were seen after Jesus was resurrected and. and um, he was seen over 500 people at once. And then there was like an investigation launched, you know, what's going on with the body. The, the Rome, remember, Romans guarded the, the, the tomb, and, and so they, they would have to fall on their swords. The Jews came up with, you know, a scheme. We'll give you money. We'll make sure you don't have to die. You know, come up with a story. They stole the body, kind of stuff. Um, I think that's another reason he left this to shroud, is proof of purchase. But there, there are stories that the, the two, um, um, Simon, the, the, the temple priest, that, that said, I just want to see the Messiah before I die, and then he saw baby Jesus. But he had two sons, and those sons had died before Jesus' you know, crucifixion, <clears throat> and then apparently they rose at the same time as the rest of the saints that rose up. And people knew these guys and said they, they apprehend the Sanhedrin and grab these guys. These are the written documents, ancient um, you know, church father documents in, in, in this council. 
Um, astounding. It's not scripture. We're not going to use it as scripture, but here's this, these two guys. They took him separately, interrogated him, and said, okay, we were at your funeral. How is it you're alive again? And he said, well, Jesus came. And he, and he brought, and he brought the, the, the thief on the cross and he was in his, hey guys, this is what it's going to be like now. This is proof. You know, you're going to paradise with me. The rest of you that would not believe the old prophets and the, and the, and the saints, you're staying here. He took the rest of them with him. So come on, let's go. What an ending, because there's a lot of accounts of people seeing this stuff. I mean, there's secular writing, too. People are seeing, you know, people appearing. It's amazing. But it's not scripture, but it is very interesting. Where was I? Did I, did I give you number six? I, let's go to number seven. Okay. Number seven is um, Luke 23, 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice and said, Father, into thy hands I commence my spirit, having thus said, he gave it the ghost. So this is more proof of the, the um, inventory of the soul. A, a, a separate existence and the body's dead. And Lord Jesus said, Father, into my hands and come in my spirit, right? So examine the death of the Lord Jesus here. And, and, and how he's magnified. And the wonders. I mean, what, what, a, what an amazing miracle. That we, we see the, the kingdom of, of God and, and his righteousness. That he's willing to offer himself as, as a, a sin offering for us, so we didn't have to go through this. So let me just recap with this. We got Father, forgive them. They do not what they do. This day you'll be with me in paradise. Woman, behold your son. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I thirst. It is finished. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Let us pray. Say this um, with me, Father God. This is my confession. This is my confession. My proclamation. I declare that there is no force ever strong enough to resist your dunamis power in my life. No sickness. No financial problems. No relationship problems, no political forces, absolutely nothing in this world has enough power to resist the supernatural power of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Thank you, Lord, that your doom's power resides in me now. And there's no room in, in my holy temple for any other spirits. Just you, Holy Spirit. So when I speak forth the Holy Word of God, every power that attempts to defy His Word is already defeated. And whenever my thoughts and my words get into agreement with the Holy Scriptures, miraculous things happen. And your Holy Living Word I see your power unleashed against all forces of evil that try to come against me. And I declare this by faith right now in the Almighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Messiah Yeshua. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. Go and be a blessing to everyone you meet. Amen. Amen.